Good evening and welcome to Keeler University webinar series, where tonight we're going to talk about the Permablate Microelectrolysis Unit. My name is Shane Breen, and I'm the Training and Events Manager here at Keeler USA. Keeler University is the education arm of Keeler, where we, we bring uh, educational material to doctors, technicians, and our distributor partners on new products, uh, hot topics in the market, and um, anything educational that we, we would like to bring out to you. As always, a really quick comment on the, the elephant in the room, COVID-19. Um, we want, here at Keeler USA, we want to make sure that you are staying safe uh, you know, every day during your practice hours. And we thank you for joining us tonight after a busy day. Uh, as always, Keeler is here to support you with uh, PPE products and items available. Um, so always think about us if you, if you have anything you need. Um, but that's all I'll, I'll say about that, and we'll keep going. During the presentation, if you have any uh, comments or questions, you have the chat box at the bottom right -hand corner of the screen. Please use that chat box for any of your comments. If you do have a question, there is a uh, icon with a question mark. Uh, when you select that, it will turn blue and anything you type will come in as a question so that we can field those questions at the end of the webinar. A quick message from Keeler USA and Permablate. Um, so Keeler is happy to partner uh, and announce our partnership with Permablate where we'll be carrying this, this product, um, the microelectrolysis unit. And we just want to thank Permablate for being here. Um, and we'll, we'll get to our first speaker, uh, Richard Grills. And Richard is a, a board member of Permablate uh, with a long academic uh, career in, in with uh, lectures, uh, as you can see here, as well as just being in the ophthalmic community uh, in development of, of products and just very knowledgeable in the field. So Richard, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, could you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and you know, your, long, your history in the ophthalmic field, as well as this, this great product that we're going to talk about tonight? Yes, thanks very much. And uh, good morning from Australia and good evening to those in America. I'm delighted that Keeler have taken this up because I have worked with Keeler for about 40 years now uh, as their representative throughout Australia and New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. And our company, which is called Designs for Vision, uh, still represents the Keeler products through that region very successfully. Originally, <clears throat> I was an optician. I worked through manufacturing, dispensing, and then in, <clears throat> into clinical work with low vision clinics at Sydney Eye Hospital and other op hospitals throughout New South Wales. My academic career started with ophthalmic optics teaching uh, the optical dispensers, orthoptists, and then ophthalmic registrars about that field. Currently, I'm still teaching at the Masters in Vision Science course at Sydney University. In business, I started Designs for Vision, which is Designs for Vision Australia, because there is a Designs for Vision American company. Designs for Vision Australia started in 1978 to provide new products and a, a variety and range of products to ophthalmologists and optometrists throughout our region. We started with two people and now the company is a public company and employs in the order of 60 to 70 people. I was the managing director for 40 years and now I'm a consultant. I met Professor Ross Spenger, who is our next speaker, in the 1970s when he was a registrar at Sydney Eye Hospital and we became colleagues and friends over the years. And as it turns out, we are still working together closely. In 2016, Dr. Professor Benja approached me to develop with him a better device for <clears throat> electrolysis and uh, permanent removal of eyelashes through ablation of the follicle. I then introduced Dr. Stuart Anouf, friend from Melbourne, <clears throat> a fellow who I've worked with a number of times on different projects. He became our recent research and development and our manufacturing officer. There are several prototypes over the five year period, about probably five or six over that period. And we eventually finished the project last year. Permablate 
was developed to provide a precise, portable and affordable service for successfully ablating the germinal follicle of an unwanted hair. Using the proven method of electrolysis with a single use, sterile, microfine, smooth tipped needle mounted in a pencil like handle, we thought we, we realized that we do have a very user friendly device. Permablate battery is held by the patient, which eliminates the need for an earth because they then become the earth. You do not need a plate or any other form of earthing method uh, with the system. The system reduces the over-treatment with collateral tissue damage, uh, with little, little collateral tissue damage, and allows treatment to be localised to the follicle of the ingrown hair. You can choose easily between the current power settings, um, which are 0.5 of a milliamp, and 0.2 of a milliamp. Most of the treatments will be in, in performed at 0.2 of a milliamp, which is a very low energy, but without local anesthetic, the patient will not tolerate it. We provide a variation of current power, which has been titrated by Professor Benja and others to the needle as needed for each patient. Power settings have been tried and tested on uh, uh, quite a large number of patients. The battery is low voltage, rechargeable, reusable, and comfortable to hold. Slide describes the system. Uh, it's supplied with a hard shell case, uh, very portable, includes a battery uh, electrical power supply and controller, the USB charging cord, a sterile single use disposable treatment needle probes. There are five of them in the box at the beginning. So you can then pre-order, you can then order afterwards um, the five probes more in each box. This is uh, doc Dr. Professor Ross Benjen ben now, um, who is a well-known oculoplastic surgeon in Sydney of long standing at Sydney Eye Hospital and Macquarie Unit Hospital in uh, the outside, outside suburbs of Sydney. And uh, he will speak to you in more detail about the clinical use of this device. Thanks very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Shane. Yes, I, I, I'm an oculoplastic surgeon. I trained in ophthalmology in Sydney and then completed fellowships in oculoplastic surgery in uh, Sydney. I uh, worked in the UK for over a year and my final fellowship for admission to an ACE office in the USA was with um, Bartley Free and Ted Bueno in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Now, electrolysis is not new. It's been around for nearly 200 years. And the as a, as a trainee, I had the opportunity to see several different methods of trying to get rid of unwanted hairs um, performed. I had the opportunity of seeing, for example, patients who came in and, and I, I happened to see them pre-treatment in the clinic. And then when I saw them a few months later, post-treatment in, in the clinic, when I, when I had not performed the treatment uh, by chance, that had cryotherapy and that developed significant cicatricial entropion of the treated segment. Um, I noted that um, galvanic cautery, uh, the hyphricator, no matter how low the setting was, press the pedal, in goes the current, certainly the, the hair follicle is destroyed, but so is a lot of the adjacent eyelid. So I came to like electrolysis and the unit that I used as was used by many ophthalmologists at the time was a perma tweeze unit and there's a photograph of it. Problems that I found were that I, I heard from people that electrolysis didn't work, but their, their method of performing it had been to perform electrolysis uh, often with no local anaesthetic injection, given it's any hair ablation follicle treatment is very painful. It had been performed just until bubbles were seen at the surface of the tissue around the inserted needle, and that, that is not enough time to treat the whole follicle. And so after seeing the bubbling for a few seconds, the ophthalmologist pulled the hair out, but it was no different than epilating or plucking a, a hair out. The follicle lived, the hair regrew. Of course it did. The sterilisation was a major problem in that, as you'll see in the photograph on your right, 
the metal stylet, which can be sterilised in a, in a readily available steam water clave, slides through a perspex or PMMA housing. And so you treat a patient, you take the uh, metal stylet out, and as it slides through that PMMA perspex housing, it leaves behind HIV or hepatitis C. And when you then treat the next patient with a, with a sterile stylet slid through that perspex housing, that uh, contaminant, that pathogen, is at risk of going on the metal stylet into the next patient. And uh, I, I discussed this with a, a colleague who worked at the um, uh, local uh, blood bank, an expert, an international expert in patient-to-patient um, -patient transmission, and he, he agreed with my suspicion that that was uh, not sterility. And so I had the, uh, the instruments that I used, a permatoise, I would take them to uh, a hospital that had a cold sterilisation unit, and that required me to travel back and forth to get the, um, the, the, the uh, perspex and metal stylet sterilised as one. So that was time, uh, to, uh, a lot of time involved in that. Um, the other interesting one was that the battery uh, to be held by the patient was very small. And uh, patients said, oh, this is difficult to hold, doctor. And particularly for the time taken, which can be a minute or more for each um, hair uh, follicle. And so they, these were the, the difficulties that I um, uh, encountered. And I, I approached Richard and said, look, I, I've looked around and I've done a search and I, I can't find any method for performing this, what, what I regard as an excellent and very localised um, method of removing unwanted hairs. Do you know of anything available? And he also researched and said, no, I don't. And I said, well, look, is there any way that you know of uh, that we, it could be developed? He, as he mentioned, he found um, uh, Dr. Stuart Enough, um, very experienced um, uh, medical practitioner, uh, developer of technology, and uh, it went from there. So I agreed to be the um, clinical uh, consultant um, to uh, Richard, uh, to Stuart, and uh, I was, in fact, continuing to perform the same procedure that I'd performed with uh, an established um, electrolysis unit, but with a much, 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 what I felt would be a, a better and easier one. Uh, and that's the background of how, how it came, uh, came to be. So the, the, as I briefly mentioned, the alternative treatment options, I, I, I had seen or tried them all, and I, I found that if, if it was hyper intense, it, it was so quick that yes, the follicle was destroyed, but so was a lot of eyelid tissue adjacent to it, uh, resulting in both functional and sometimes aesthetic changes for patients that they really uh, didn't want. If it's, uh, and that would include hyfrication, uh, electrocautery. Cryotherapy, although the probe, a probe comes with a fine point, it doesn't go into the follicle and cryotherapy of a hair follicle requires a much longer application than cryotherapy of, say, an epithelial skin lesion. And so, again, a large ice ball is formed to get rid of one follicle and uh, a, wide, a, a wide area of tissue damage beyond the follicle occurs. The one unit that can be potentially turned right down to a very, very low, slow delivery of power is a radiofrequency unit but a very, very expensive unit to be, to be bought. Um, and um, in contrast, electrolysis looks to be a very, very affordable option for, for um, providing to the patient um, and achieve the same, which is a slow, precise removal of the hair follicle. And uh, that's why I, I persisted with, uh, with electrolysis. So I went along to Richard and, and Stuart, and, I, and they, these are the things that I said, look, I think electrolysis is a, is a proven method of hair removal. It's performed in the consulting rooms in the clinic. It's not an operating theatre procedure. It doesn't require patient sedation uh, or overnight stay. Uh, it does require lo uh, local anaesthetic um, so that the procedure is pain-free. But the problems I'm having are, and I describe them, 
and this is what I would like to see develop um, if possible for my use and um, uh, though the thing, so it's, a, it's got to be sterile it has to be precise, easy to handle for the operator. The, the permatwees um, unit was actually uh, a bit difficult. It's a bit like holding a, a pencil that's been so shortened it doesn't fit into your hand. It fits, it fits into your fingertips. It doesn't write quite so readily. So I wanted a, a, a pencil handle for it um, so that I could rotate the, you know, hand, the needle around the follicle to distribute the electrolysis effect. Um, easy to carry so so i thought about field work um, in the in the outback or in in um, uh, developing nations where and not at, not in your suburban office uh, comprehensive ophthalmology practice uh, affordable yes and um, an overall user friendly for both the ophthalmologist and indeed the patient so i asked that a, a battery be made large enough that even a patient with a with a, um, arthritis in, in the hand could hold it easily without it, without it being uncomfortable. And that's what I uh, believe that um, Richard uh, and Stuart developed. So how does the electrolysis work? Well, I, I, I found out, as I say, it's been around for nearly 200 years. An electrical current flows from the negative charge of the needle electrode, which is in the patient's tissues, back to the positive charge of the battery that's being held by the patient. The patient doesn't feel a thing. Uh, when, except holding the, the battery because they would feel a thing in the eyelid or in the, the tissues if they didn't have an injection of anaesthetic put in there first. And the, the polarity which develops around the needle produces hydroxide ions and then with the uh, sodium chloride in uh, tissues, sodium hydroxide or lye forms and that chemically necrosis the follicle tissue. Compared with other methods, it, it's slow. Uh, as I say, it may take a minute um, sometimes to, to get to the point where every follicle cell is ablated. But if you're going to do it, you have to do it long enough that complete necrosis in the follicle occurs. But the beauty of it is in being so you've got time to test and test and check that you're not doing damage to tissues around it. So uh, th th this is how, how I've performed it and we'll show you in the video shortly. I put a, a drop of local anaesthetic, a methacaine, tetracaine into the into the uh, the eye on the side we're treating, and then inject uh, local anaesthetic um, slowly. I use a xylocaine, one percent with with adrenaline, one in a hundred thousand, and, and give that time to work. It's it's actually as as you all know as clinicians, pretty rapid in its onset. So the patient holds the battery, and a little tip is get the patient to hold a moistened battery or moisten the patient's hand, the electrical current flows a bit better. Then you put the micro needle. Uh, uh, I use an, a, a six times operating microscope, but a, a loop of um, two or three times magnification uh, would be enough. But place the, uh, the, the needle alongside the hair to be treated and slide it down until you feel minimal resistance, which will only be a millimetre or two, that's the depth of a normal hair follicle in the eyelid, then you're able to rotate that um, needle um, within the follicle, so you distribute the uh, electrolysis effect, distribute the sodium hydroxide. And so you get localised electrolysis, and you, you see bubbling, indicating, as I stress, commencement of the um, ablation procedure, not completion. I always start on the low setting with the permablate unit and, and just some background. What we did was we took cold sterilised, so truly sterilised perma tweeze units and tested the electrical um, current delivered at the needle tip in a series of patients before we began this, this clinical assessment of the permablate unit. And that's uh, because I had noted that in, in some patients I'd put the perma unit in that had no current setting. I'd see a lot of bubbles. In other patients, I'd put the needle in and see virtually no bubbles. And uh, I, th this turned out to be that the, the amount of bubbling reflects the uh, amount of current being um, delivered. So I start on the low setting. And if I, if I don't see much bubbling, I increase the current setting to high. Uh, that patient requires a higher setting and then I continue. But I, I err on the side of it being not over in one set, one or two seconds like other hyper-intense methods are. I err on the side where I've got time to rotate the needle 
And then when I suspect it from the appearance of the hair becoming appearing to be loosened, I, I get a sterile cotton bud uh, or, the, or uh, wipe out with the needle itself. And mostly, once actual ablation of, the, of all of the follicle cells, the, the hair is not stuck to any living cell, the hair will literally float out. On rare occasions, I found um, I, I, I got a pair of sterile forceps and gently tried to, to lift it just in case it, I couldn't, it wasn't being wiped out. And if any resistance, I stress any resistance is required, I would go back and continue with the electrolysis until no resistance was found. It's really a waste of your time and the patient's time if you don't treat the follicle long enough. You might as well just um, epilate, pluck out the lash every time the patient comes along for a visit. Interestingly, on that note, I saw many patients in the treatment trial which, which I conducted who reported attending uh, a practitioner, an optometrist in most cases, um, every, quote, every few weeks or, quote, every few months over 10 to 20 years having epilation performed because um, there was felt to be no uh, other alternative um, for them. So we're going to show the procedure video now. It does have voice dubbing, and so I'll um, watch that with you. The permablate electrolysis instrument comprises a mains electric power unit used for charging the reusable, rechargeable battery. And a disposable, sterile, single-use needle housed in a pencil-like handle. Charge the battery by connecting it to the mains electric power supply. The light on the battery will glow red on connection and become green when the battery is fully charged with power. The battery has low and high settings of the current strip. This will provide sufficient power for several hours of permablate use. Open a disposable sterile permablate unit and connect its power cable to the battery. Set the battery power strength on low. Maintain the sterility of the microfine gold-plated follicle needle. The sterile single-use electrolysis needle is microfine and gold-plated, allowing for smooth and accurate insertion alongside the hair into its follicle. Instill a drop of local anaesthetic into the eye and then draw up local anaesthetic ready for injection into the eyelid. And then inject local anaesthetic into the eyelid to be treated. While most patients do not require pain relief additional to the local anaesthetic injection following the permablate electrolysis treatment, it should be made available to them. The electrolysis process can be enhanced by moistening the hand used by the patient in holding the battery, thereby increasing electrical conductivity. Set the battery current strength on low. With magnified viewing, gently insert the sterile needle into the follicle of the hair to be treated. The appearance of tissue bubbling at the surface will indicate that electrolysis has just begun. Tissue bubbling does not mean that the germinal cells have all been destroyed and the follicle has been ablated, as this may take a minute or so to achieve. If tissue bubbling is minimal, move the battery's power switch to high. Rotate the needle around the hair so that all of the follicle germinal cells are reached and treated. Of the ablated, if the hair is pulled out, when there is resistance, it will be no different than simple epilation and the hair will regrow.
The achievement of complete follicle cell ablation will be seen when the hair floats out of the follicle on the needle or can be wiped out of the follicle with a sterile cotton bud. If either of these is not possible, try lifting the hair out with forceps. But if any resistance at all is felt, then the hair follicle needs to be treated for longer as ablation has not been achieved. At the completion of treatment, dispose of the contaminated sharp needle appropriately and disinfect the battery ready for reuse. Ready for use with a new disposable single-use needle. summarizes what I found in um, treating 65 eyelids in 48 patients over a period of three years. There were 30 female and 18 male, age range 36 to 89, mean age 68. And the etiology, uh, interesting spread. Um, in 21 patients, um, it was eyelid margin shrinkage. Um, idiopathic often, uh, sometimes it was, uh, there was enough evidence of blepharitis that one could conclude or one could feel that the shrinkage came from the blepharitis, but there are papers on idiopathic margin shrinkage in humans um, uh, with increasing age. 16 were post-inflammatory, including uh, the, the commonest within that group was uh, ocular cicatricial or systemic pemphigoid. 13 were post-surgical reconstruction following removal of uh, uh, lesions, um, particularly carcinoma. Though. Seven were, uh, were an isolated meibomian gland contracture notch, uh, completely asymptomatic until the notch led to the uh, hair in front of it being drawn back and rubbing on the eye and the patient would present with a foreign body um, symptoms uh, without any history of inflammation in the myobamian gland. Six were um, uh, trachoma um, and two were uh, post-industrial um, uh, in uh, or other trauma. Now, given that the natural cycle of hair growth uh, takes place over about nine or maybe a few more months, I allowed a one-year follow-up for the patient to be um, free of any further ingrowing hairs um, as the cutoff period for, for follow-up. A patient who'd had a hair or hairs treated successfully and been a, a symptom, been, been what I would call disease-free or hair, ingrowing hair-free for a year, I, I could never say to them, in your lifetime, you'll never get another ring. That's not how um, uh, the natural history works. But that was the reason that one year uh, was used. So I, I looked at the number of treatments needed. Now, the, it's reasonable to think that the less number of hairs, the less number of treatments um, uh, would be, be needed. And that, in, in fact, is how it turned out. Because w when a patient presents and says, I, I've had ingrowing uh, hairs pulled out for some years, every few weeks or every few months, at any one time, the only Unless you use a widely ablating method such as a broad cryotherapy probe to treat a whole area at once, uh, you can only treat the visible ingrowing hair. And, and my belief was treat just the ingrowing hair. And so the patients were very, very uh, carefully informed. I go back and, and stress they must have local anaesthetic injected so that they can tolerate the awful pain, which they'd otherwise feel, long enough that you can destroy every germinal cell uh, in the follicle. Otherwise, you might as well just perform an epilation. Now, in ophthalmology, um, a lot of topical antibiotic and a lot of topical steroid is given for sometimes questionable reasons. And so uh, I, I took it upon the, the view that if a patient cut his or her eyelid in the bathroom, the odds are he or she would not use antibiotic or steroid on the wound. Now, I was performing 
a procedure with a sterile injection of local anesthetic and a sterile uh, needle tip probe. I, I was not using any uh, patient to patient, uh, having any patient to patient risk or other risk. And so I didn't uh, ask them to use antibiotic drops or ointment or systemic, nor the case with steroid. They all telephoned the next day as this was an office procedure. Um, nobody su reported significant post-treatment um, pain uh, that was of a concern. And, and the vast majority didn't feel the need to take EG paracetamol for, for pain relief. No incidence of infection occurred. Uh, and so it, it really was a very, very um, happy outcome um, in that the, uh, the, the follicle uh, or follicles were ablated. They found the procedure easy. And interestingly, some of them said that they found the, the act of holding the, the large diameter comfortable battery uh, they felt they were actually helping in their treatment and, and taking part in their treatments. There were patients within those that really stick in my mind who, uh, uh, who'd had 20 years of, of epilation performed in, in all good faith uh, by the practitioner, but, but um, uh, said the symptoms uh, before presenting to the practitioner for epilation were awful. And um, he and, uh, and a couple of others uh, described the outcome of, of not having that as, as uh, they rated it very, 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 very highly. So all in all, I, I came to the, conclude that uh, the brief that I'd taken along to Richard and he and Stuart had proceeded with had, had a very, very um, uh, good outcome. Um, and I, I, I've been very pleased with the, um, uh, with the results of, of, of the unit that, that uh, they have developed. Uh, I guess the name sums up what we aim for and what we, what I feel can be achieved, that is permanent ablation. Um, I go back and, and repeat, I always tell patients, I can't promise you that in your next 40 or 50 years of life, you won't develop another ingrowing eyelid here, but those, those particular ones uh, we would have to have dealt with uh, without, without causing um, unnecessary um, collateral damage to your eyelid function or appearance. Thank you, Richard and uh, Dr. Benger, for uh, letting us know about the Permablate unit uh, and how you came about, you know, deciding to pursue uh, this product, how this product is, you know, helping every day in not only, like you said, for mission trips and, and items like that, but can be used in general ophthalmology practice, uh, optometrist practices for another method to ablate the hair um, instead of just plucking and having that hair regrow. And, and from your clinical assessment and uh, the number of eyelids that you saw, the success rate is fairly high <laughs> uh, compared to other methods. And, and that goes to show, uh, at least to me, uh, ablation using electrolysis is, is absolutely a method that is treating um, this ingrowth of, of the hair follicle in the eyelid and not, not having the, the use of antibiotics or steroids, no infections. I mean, those, those are all great outcomes and I do appreciate um, both of you coming to today for the webinar uh, and speaking to everybody who's in attendance. And, and just before we get um, to the question and answers, um, you know, and we'll give some time for any attendees if they have questions for you to, to field. Uh, again, feel free to use the chat box at the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, select the question mark icon and then type in your question and we can put that on the screen for, um, for either to answer. But just to summarize, all of the items that you set out to do, and, and it's very impressive to, to provide the sterile probe because of the issues with sterilization, uh, having to take time and go to that cold sterilization process, multi-step process for previous units, and instead making it an easy individually wrapped product or individually wrapped probe rather, um, and easily disinfectable as far as what is actually uh, being held by the patient, having that precise location using the handle and, and the, the probe tip being easy easy to use and, and rotate around that hair follicle for the germinal necrosis. And then obviously the portability is, is a great thing, can be taken anywhere, the affordability and, and the user-friendly obviously too. But with that, and as we wait for questions, if there are any, um, I'll, so I'll put this up for now, but Dr. Benger, I do have two questions um, for from myself. The, the first one, was you, you talked about the anesthetic several times and, and put a lot of emphasis 
uh, on the use of the local anesthetic. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? I mean, how how much anesthetic do you use, and maybe what is the um, the proper way to go about that? Uh, look, some background on that. I think, uh, and maybe it's a it's a past era, but I used to talk with uh, with with uh, people about how they treated ingrowing hairs, and I was struck by the view that you could put a drop of anaesthetic into the eyelid and then the method of ablation would be so quick that it would be no more painful than having an injection of anaesthetic, therefore no anaesthetic injection was given. That a procedure such as hyfrication might be over in a couple of seconds and the patient go, ouch, what was that? But electrolysis is a slow process and I've explained the benefit of that is that you've got time to check that you, you, you keep the ablation to the follicle and you don't spread it around unnecessarily into the tissues. The, the volume, Shane, I would, I would say uh, an average uh, eyelid, uh, two mils. I, I know there are people who inject half a mil, half a cc, with the view that you, don't want, you mustn't put in too much. But uh, I then hear that they often have to then re-inject more anaesthetic during the procedure because the patient says out. So I've always been a great believer in, I, I don't put in 10 mils into an eyelid, but I, uh, I would say the average is um, one and a half to two and a half uh, mils, depending on uh, how widespread I want it to be. I, I like them as when I go to the dentist, I like to have uh, one injection um, that lasts. And the, the thing about using a drop of anaesthetic first is something that I also learned early in my career and in part from the dentist, by applying something to the surface, the, the, the needle goes through without, uh, often without any pain at all. The patient says, have you done the injection yet after they've had the anaesthetic eye drop? And, and ophthalmologists would, would know this. So that would be, I think, standard practice. Um, the drop goes in first before the injection. Um, but it, it, it um, uh, you, yeah, so I have stressed you, you have to do it long enough. If you're going to bother to try and ablate it permanently, you have to take give enough time for it to be effective. It's a, it's a waste of time being too quick for you and for the patient. And then um, the other question, I so obviously some time and, and anesthetic to, to really treat that, that follicle, but uh, my other question is, the, the importance that you placed on localization for permablate and um, localization for the procedure in itself, how, how important is that? Look, I, I, I rated it very, very highly from very early on in my training. I, had, I, had, I guess the benefit for me was seeing the established modalities, which at the time were um, electrolysis with the perma-tweez perma unit and thinking, oh, I'm not sure about that, that that's sterile. Um, the hyfrication uh, and, and then seeing, you know, a, a lot of lo local eyelid contracture occur and, and even more so with the cryotherapy unit. Now, I do respect the fact that many ophthalmologists perform those, those procedures and are very happy so and, and I respect their decision. But I, I felt that the electrolysis, uh, a very old method, but I felt that it could be localised and the, the worries I had were big one, um, sterility, a lot of time uh, and effort to make sure the unit was sterile um, uh, and, and the comfort for the patient um, and, uh, and the affordability too, particularly. In, uh, and if, if, if you're doing work uh, other than in your well set up suburban uh, ophthalmology comprehensive practice, if you're traveling in uh, remote regions, um, carrying around a heavy big piece of uh, equipment, um, it's, it's easier to carry something as, as small and portable as possible. So uh, electrolysis uh, lends itself to be exactly that. Um, and that, that's, they're the reasons that I, as an individual, uh, liked and, and pursued uh, electrolysis and um, was, have been very happy with the results. Fantastic. And at this time, I would like to open it up. If there is anybody um, in the chat, uh, I don't see any questions at the moment, um, but we'll give a minute in case one pops into your into your mind. But as we go through, if we don't see anything pop up shortly, um, that would conclude our webinar this evening. Again, uh, Richard and Ross, uh, Dr. Benger, thank you so much for joining us uh, here on the webinar. 
Um, and I want to let everybody on, on the call know, uh, again, thank you for joining after a long day. Uh, I know you, I'm sure you're finishing up your clinics uh, wherever you may be, and then joining us this evening um, for our Keele University webinar series. If you need more information or would like to see some of the other webinars done previously, uh, please go to keeleuniversity.com where there's some other uh, products and procedures that we go through similar to tonight. Uh, as well, you know, uh, going forward, the Permablate product, will be we're going to be carrying it here at Keeler. Uh, you can find that product uh, starting next week, keelerusa.com. Feel free to jump on there and, and see all the other products um, available through Keeler. It seems like we have some questions rolling in now, so we'll, we can go back to. So we always get the question, right? What is the price? So the price for the Permablate kit that you saw is uh, $995 US. And then the, the refillable five probes, you can get the, the five pack of disposable probes uh, after you have the unit, once you've used up the first five, and that price is $144 US. And I don't see, uh, I don't see anything else rolling in. So again, thank you again, Richard, Ross, uh, and everybody who joined the webinar this evening. And with that, uh, I will, will end it. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out, like we mentioned. Give us a call at Keeler, and uh, if you need any any more questions, uh, you can you can send uh, send that call over to me. Just ask for me at the, the home office, and uh, I'll be able to answer anything you got. Thanks very much, Shane. Absolutely, everyone. Take care. Have a good night. <laughs>